Hi everyone, I'm Larry Lavanka, and welcome to In Studio at Bergen Community College, our new interview format TV show where we try and bring you interesting people who have something interesting to say. And we certainly have that today with two people who are scholars in the field of philosophy. We have Massimo Pigalucci, who is the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at City College, and we have Dr. Peter DeLugos, who is our own uh, Chair of Philosophy and Religion here at Bergen Community College. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for doing this today. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll start um, with, with something that it, it just seems appropriate for um, scholars of philosophy. Um, this has to be the question that you'd start with. What, why are we here? <laughs> what, what, what does it all mean? Because you asked us. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness. Um, stoicism is your discipline, Massimo, um, and you teach it a lot in your That's coursework, true. Peter. So Stoicism, what is it all about? It sounds a little intimidating to a lay person. <laughs> Tell me, Stoicism, what does it mean? It's an ancient philosophy uh, developed in, in Greece uh, and Rome, and uh, it basically teaches two or three basic things. It is about uh, developing character. Uh, it's the idea that it's important to take care of your character, your integrity. Uh, it is about uh, the goal of one's life is uh, to achieve tranquility, uh, peace of mind, uh, to be able to deal with life in a, uh, in a, in a good way. And then um, it is about the fact that we have certain things that are under our control and other things that are not under our control. And wisdom comes out of making that distinction and being able to figure out priorities in life. Uh, based on what it is that important to you, what is it that you can achieve, and what is it that may be left behind because it's not that important or it's not achievable. What are the origins of Stoicism? Where does this come from? Uh, it, it's a school of uh, thought that was established in Athens around 300 BCE by a guy named Zeno. And uh, Zeno was a merchant who actually lost everything that he owned in, uh, in a shipwreck and, uh, and he arrived in Athens. And uh, the story goes that he's, he, he walked into a bookshop and uh, he started browsing and he was interested in philosophy and he asked the bookshop, you know, bookseller, uh, where he could find a good philosopher and the guy pointed out, well, there's one out right out there. Uh, Zeno followed them and he started uh, studying philosophy formally and then eventually a few years later um, he established his own uh, school which became to be known as Stoicism after the, the word Stoa which uh, is an a, a open portico. Uh, that was a public place in uh, Athens where the Stoics met. So still relevant today, you, you obviously integrated into your coursework. Um, Absolutely. How do you do that? Well, we read uh, uh, Epictetus, one of the more famous uh, later Stoics, every semester uh, as a follow-up to Aristotle. Um, and it's part of a, uh, the first half of the course, which is asking the question, how should we approach life? How should we live? What kinds of things should we value? So we read it as one of several different uh, perspectives and answers to that question. But I have to say, it's one of the uh, segments of the course that moves students um, more than the others in some sense. It's, it's deeply challenging. And also, I think students find, uh, after studying it, that they get insight about living and living well more from, that, from those readings than the others. Um, it's just a powerful, it's, it's a powerful set of uh, uh, mental exercises, uh, questions that you ask yourself about what matters, about what good character is, about how to think about difficulty in life. And uh, people, I think, generally find it to be uh, something that is really helpful. Do you, do you think, to an extent, uh, people are practicing Stoics and maybe they don't know it? Certainly that's the case for a number of people. Uh, some people are drawn to Stoicism simply because they're sort of what I call them natural proto-Stoics. Mm -hmm. Some people have a certain personality that uh, resonates very well with Stoic ideas. Uh, but, but people that don't have that can still benefit from Stoicism or from other similar philosophies like Buddhism or Taoism from the Eastern traditions. Um, because even if you don't have the kind of character uh, that, that resonates, you still get a lot out of the basic ideas and the basic practices. The idea of being mindful, for instance, every time that you do something and you engage in an activity. Uh, being mindful for a Stoic means uh, paying attention to why you're doing certain things and the consequences of what you're doing. Uh, you're making we're making choices every minute of our life. And, and those choices have consequences, which often we are sort of unaware of or we don't think about. You know, for instance, if I go grocery shopping, uh, where my food comes from and you know, the kind of environmental impact that it has, the kind of 
treatment of the workers that produce that food, the animals that uh, turned into my food, and so on and so forth, right? All of that has practical ethical impact. But most of us don't think about it. It's just right. grocery shopping, right? And yet, going to the grocery store, which I will do in a few minutes when I get home, <laughs> it's an exercise in stoicism, meaning that, you know, I, it, it, I don't want it to sound sort of self-important or anything like that. It's simply a, a question of paying attention to what you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, what I'm hearing is that stoicism is, is actually a pretty hot topic in, uh, in modern culture, even if people don't realize it, you know? So, I mean, is it possible that we're going to see uh, a rise of stoicism? Do you think this philosophy will uh, take off in a sense? Well, I would say just in response that one of the reasons it may appear to be a hot topic is that uh, one of the more common therapies these days, cognitive behavioral therapy, is really rooted in Stoic philosophy. Mm. So the ideas of Frankel, the ideas of Albert Ellis, um, which are quite effective, shown to be effective, are actually steeped in Stoic ideas. Mm. Um, so the idea of letting go, for example, some of these catchphrases we have in our culture mm -hmm. needing to let go, um, are directly out of, out of Stoic philosophy. And it's yeah. also true that there has been an uh, increased public interest in, in the last several years mm. uh, about Stoicism as a practical philosophy. There are clubs of people that meet together because they want to study uh, Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius or, or the other Stoic authors. There are conferences, public conferences devoted to Stoics, not, not just uh, you know, scholarly activities, but, but people are, you know, everyday people with no background in philosophy who are interested in, in it. And there are actually some best-selling books. Uh, there was a, a book that came out uh, last year, I think, uh, by Ryan Holiday. Uh, it's called uh, The Obstacle is the Way. Mm -hmm. And it's a bestseller. It's a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and it's used, uh, it, I think there are a couple of NFL um, uh, hmm. coaches that actually use it in their, in their practice. Um, it's also, by the way, has, uh, Stoicism also has a lot of, uh, has had a lot of influence in, uh, in the military. Uh, there is Which a number, sense. it's taught in the military academies uh, together with other aspects of what is called virtual ethics, which is a broader approach of which stoicism is a part. And there are some leading military figures who have actually uh, used stoicism. They, they, they said that stoicism was an inspiration to overcome uh, difficulties in their own life, in their own career. How did we get to this point? I mean, was, was, did Stoicism go away at any point during history? Did other philosophies rise? Has it been bubbling uh, beneath the surface throughout? Or um, what would be a read on something like that? Well, it, uh, as, a, as a formal uh, uh, school of philosophy, it ended with the end of the Roman Empire, uh, just like every other Hellenistic philosophy, Epicureanism, mm -hmm. uh, Aristotelianism, Platonism. Uh, and that was for a variety of reasons, but mostly because of the rise of Christianity. In fact, Christianity absorbed a lot of Stoic ideas. Uh, Epictetus' manual was used by Christian monks early on as a training manual for spiritual exercises, for instance. And many of the church fathers incorporated Stoic ideas into their own uh, teachings. Mm -hmm. Then after that, Stoicism sort of laid below the surface. It was, uh, you know, a lot of Stoic ideas kept uh, um, being... Uh, uh, passed from one generation to another. They influenced a number of prominent philosophers, including Descartes and Spinoza. Um, and then they finally reemerged, as, as we just heard, uh, in the second half of the 20th century because of the um, emergence of cognitive behavioral therapy, logotherapy, and similar kinds of approaches. Hmm. You could think of it as a, as, a, as a systematic way of living well that is not attached to any religion, existing religion. You know, so it's sort of a, it's, I think it fits, it, it's certainly compatible with religious ways of right. thinking, but it can also be viewed as a secular philosophy of life um, that, that has a certain shape and character that allows you to implement it and, and live according to it. It right. sounds appealing. I mean, do you, do you think this sounds... I think it is appealing. I think the ideas are uh, easy in the sense that they're approachable by people without a background in philosophy. Mm. Anybody can read a pick, pick, pick up uh, Epictetus' discourses and read them without having any background in philosophy and understand them. Mm -hmm. um, but as Epictetus himself tells his students in the discourses, you know, one thing is the theory, another thing is the practice. And practice is difficult because... Uh, Stoic philosophy basically tells you to constantly be aware of your reactions, your emotions, or thinking about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and try to get, uh, you know, to chart the best course of action. That is a demanding philosophy. That is something that demands of us every day that we do the best that we can do. How do you work in other philosophies when you teach? Okay, uh, there's not just one way to live life, as any of us would probably agree. So to a student who's hearing Stoicism, that sounds great, but there's dozens of other ways to live your life as well. Do you blend them together or do you 
practice uh, just one form of, of philosophy. What do you think? Mm. Well, I, I, would, I would say that, that you know, Stoicism is grounded in certain principles that if you're attracted to, you believe are true. Um, and it certainly doesn't mean that other positions are going to be necessarily incompatible with mm. those. Right? So it's, it's not as if you're signing up for a, a set of doctrines that are somehow <laughs> controversial and, mm. and, and incompatible with other ways of thinking. I think Stoicism is perfectly compatible with natural science. Uh, for example, and principles of psychology, so it's not it's it's not a competition necessarily, right. and also for which you do for here me, plenty, you know. I, I mean, right, there's plenty. that's true. For me, it's also more of a personal daily practice rather than um, something that I would espouse, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, like a salesman. Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of teaching with uh, to the yeah. to students, so it, I approach teaching Stoicism in my classes in the same way in which I approach uh, teaching, you know, Buddhism or, or, or Aristotelianism or anything else. Mm -hmm. So you present the ideas and you emphasize their practical aspects if there are uh, and where they are and you emphasize the theory. And then you let the student sort of think about, you know, learn about these ways of thinking. I mean, that the, the broader issue is one that all of these philosophies have in common and in fact they have in they have it in common with a number of religious traditions, which is the idea of developing one's own philosophy of life in the sense of one's priorities. Think about your priorities and why they're your, your priorities and, and how to pursue the best life you can possibly pursue. That's what it means to have a philosophy of life. If it happens to be inspired by Stoicism, great. If it happens to be inspired by Buddhism or Taoism or something else or Christianity, it's also great. And um, uh, I agree that a lot of these traditions, when you go down to the basic ideas, they actually tend to be much more compatible. The, 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 the things that they have in common, uh, I think, are more important than the, the differences that, that are a little bit more, more superficial. Um, we might have gotten some of it, but the next question, I mean, is there a single uh, refrain that you keep coming back to? Is there a principle that you keep coming back to as you live your life and as you teach? Is there something that is, uh, you know, that one thing that keeps bringing you back? Yeah, for me there are actually two, and both of them come from Epictetus. Um, one is the way in which his handbook starts. The very first sentence in the, in the handbook of Epictetus is, some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you say it like that, it sounds like trivial. Well, of course, that's true. But if you start thinking about it, that means that... Uh, what you want to do in life is to make your best effort to achieve what you want to, want to achieve. But at the same time, you have to accept with equanimity that the outcomes of your, of your efforts may not be entirely up to you. They depend on other people. They depend on, on circumstances. And so you do the best you can, but then you accept what the universe basically comes up with uh, as a result. Mm -hmm. The second principle uh, that I remind myself very often uh, is, is uh, the treatment of what Stoics called impressions. An impression is your first reaction to something. So suppose that uh, you hear a, a, a noise at night up in your house and you, you know, you're scared, you're, you're afraid, right? That's a natural reaction. That's what the Stoics called an impression. And Epictetus always says to treat impressions in this way. You interrogate them. You say, well, you are an impression, but let me see if you're really the thing that you, that you think that I think you are, or maybe you're something different. So what does that mean? Well, I hear the, the, the rumor, I, I read the, sorry, the sound, and I, I'm afraid. My first reaction is, is, is fear. But really, do I have any reason to be afraid? Maybe it's just the wind that, you know, that right. closed a, 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 a door or something like that. I should investigate that. I should not react immediately on the basis of my first impression. I should take a break and say, well, let's see. What is the best thing to do with this, thing? Well, whatever it is that it's happening? Uh, Peter, as we wrap up here, any... Uh... I would say ditto to that. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think every day I try to, uh, this might sound kind of corny, but I try to put kindness out into the world, knowing that it actually ripples out and that kindness is usually repaid with kindness and that we can help make the world a better place just by the way we live. Now, that's good advice, my friends. So uh, mm. thank you to both of you for being here today on uh, our inaugural uh, edition of this program. Thank you very much. We're thank honored. You. Thank you. For Bergen Community College, I am Larry Lavanka. This was In Studio at Bergen Community College. Thanks and take care.